Well, it's uh, wonderful to be back at the, at the festival. Um, I think the last time I was here was for my art book, Glittering Images, in 2012. And um, th this new book is my eighth. It's a collection of, um, of pieces published in a wide variety of places, some very obscure, and it's extremely eager to get um, some of that material finally you know, into a, a major public space. Um, in particular, I have um, this massively long uh, essay called Cults in Cosmic Consciousness, Religious Vision in the American 1960s. I think it demands a, a, a rethinking of what the legacy of the 1960s was about. It wasn't just about politics, it was also about culture. It was about um, a, a kind of perspective on the universe, you know, full of, full of wisdom and daring. Um, and I think um, right now, with the, with the uh, you know, political passions surging in the United States, I think uh, a, a return to this, to me, you know, the expanded uh, vision, the expanded imagination of the 1960s is, is uh, absolutely um, critical. I, I think, you know, one of my... Uh, primary themes has always been uh, that um, there is a higher vision, a higher perspective that takes in the whole of the universe, that, that uh, society is important, but it's only a small box in the you know, vastness of, of the universe. The uh, society, it's, you know, we, we, I, I've obviously been paying, I've been uh, analyzing political issues, political personalities, uh, political ideals and failures, in, you know, in my in my work, but um, in in no way would I identify myself um, purely in partisan terms. I don't think any intellectual should be partisan, or rather, in real life, you you belong to a political party, but you don't um, you don't make the mistake of thinking that. Um, that political positions and membership in a party is a kind of new dogma, new religion. So what I'm calling for in, in this book, uh, as, in, as in my prior writing, um, is a return to um, consideration, serious consideration of religion. I'm an atheist, but uh, I have been calling for 25 years now for um, the, you know, the ideal core curriculum uh, for a multicultural perspective in uh, colleges is a study of the great world religions. Of, um, we're talking here about Hinduism, Buddhism, Judeo-Christianity, and Islam. I don't, I don't know how you can understand any other culture without knowing the religious premises of that culture. Uh, and also, by studying religion, you uh, are able to uh, you, you're able to experience poetry of the highest level, um, art, architecture, mythology, and so on. The um, you know the present doctrines that suffuse elite education in the United States seem to me utterly pernicious. Uh, I've been railing against postmodernism and poststructuralism for a quarter century uh, and, and, and warning, 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 warning of the results of gutting the humanities uh, curriculum as has been done. And now we see it all around us, um, you know, a whole generation of, of young people um, who, who parents are bankrupt, bankrupting themselves, send them to elite schools to receive um, an education, basically cynicism and chaos. Uh, there's no sense of um, historical perspective. History is regarded as a false narrative okay, that, we, that uh, is imposed by uh, power cells uh, who are simply interested in establishing and spreading their own personal power and so on. Just like simplistic kinds of canards you know, flowing from the mouths of professors who have made no serious study of, um, of history. Now what you get with me is someone who, who was uh, very interested in archaeology from the earliest years. And uh, my, my first job I wanted to have was an um, Egyptologist. Uh, when I say anything about culture, contemporary culture even, um, there, I have you know, behind this my, my sense of history, not just to the great civilizations of the ancient Near East, but back to the Stone Age. You know, I mean, I don't, this is none of, uh, none of my uh, opponents in, um, in academe have any kind of, of, of scholarly 
a perspective of this kind. I, I don't regard them as scholars, in fact. You know, we have, you know, the, the, the leading figures in academe uh, of my generation are careerists, okay? They, they, they're, um, uh, they're, you know, professional cynics. Uh, they they, they uh, pretend to a leftism that is, is false because they, you know, these people are multimillionaires. The, the leading leftists, you know, live like kings. Um, these, the leading leftists on college campuses said nothing about the gross expansion of a tyrannical uh, administrative class of bureaucrats. They said nothing about the obscene rise in tuition costs, which have, uh, have had such a horrible negative effect on families and burdened so many students with, with debt. Uh, uh, they said very little about the um, enslavement, the servitude of of, uh, of adjunct instructors in, uh, paid a pittance and denied benefits and so on. Okay, what kind of leftism is that? Okay, <laughs> okay, pretty phony. Okay, all right. But um, much as I enjoy belaboring my opponents, I want <laughs> there's, there's much else in my book. All right. Um, I'm, I, I'm very happy to finally be able to um, get my, my piece about, uh, their early piece about writing for the internet on, you know, and finally you know, in, into uh, you know, in the public arena here, uh, because I was um, a co-founding cont contributor to Salon.com from its very first issue in 1995 at a time when, um, hard to believe, the web was not being taken seriously by many, by academics, by other journalists. In fact, a, uh, a, a prominent political journalist at the Boston Globe warned me, um, you know, t told me, why are you, why are you writing f for, the, for the web? No one takes the web seriously. Okay? That, that, and, and now, you know, the web has this giant tsunami um, has, uh, for good and for ill, has, uh, has uh, you know, has, uh, I mean, caused the, you know, the slow financial um, sinking and eventual extinction, probably, of, of newspapers themselves which is, uh, to me, a tragedy. I, I, I feel I learned a great deal from newspapers. Uh, there's something about the physical newspaper, uh, turning the pages, surveying it, scanning the news, t taking all the news in, uh, that you really can't get on, uh, via the web. I, I, so my, my main news intake now is, is from the web, but it's, it's, I, I know that my students uh, don't read newspapers and that after my generation goes, there'll be no newspapers left. Everything will have moved, moved to the web. I think it's extremely un unfortunate because it, what it means is that, um, is that journalists now don't um, work up you know, through small regional newspapers um, learning how to go out there with shoe leather and pursue a story, gather facts, um, act like a detective, and, and then arrange all these facts in a, uh, in a rational, logical manner, and then have an editor okay, there you know, to, to provide feedback for this material. Now people, are, you know, what's coming out even from the New York Times, oh my God, has the New York Times degenerated. Um, you know, oh, oh Lord, I mean, it's like, it's like the level, the, the columnists are like the level of women's magazines, okay, of, you know, from back when I was growing up. Uh, just like this pouring out. No sense whatever, okay, that an article that one writes, okay, has a structure or should have a structure. That perhaps it should have paragraphs, okay, you know, that, perha that perhaps um, it, it could be edited and shortened and, and, be, and be far more forcible if condensed. I, 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 I'm lucky enough to have been able to write for the newspapers um, at their height, okay, still in the early 90s before the arrival of, of the web or of web journalism. Uh, I lo and I loved it because um, the very things that most professors consider limiting, that is the, um, you know, the, the space considerations, I, you know, I found very stimulating to be able to, um, to express all, all all of one's points within 800 words or, or 900 words, the classic op-ed structure as it was developed originally by, by the New York Times, I think. And then, um, and then often at you know, a deadline, there'll be some other issue. The, the piece will have to be shortened further because the, you know, the art department has like the, have a big lavish illustration which always eat, you know, eats up space. So that was a real discipline, um, that period. And now with the web, you can go on and on and on as long as you want. But um, you know, beyond that, uh, uh, what, what I'm hoping people are n noticing that as some of these uh, Tony literary journals, like the New York Review of Books, go online, 
that you, you, you can see how um, fossilized the prose of those journals is when it transfers to the web. You try to read it on the web, these things that are written for the New York Review of Books or even the Times Literary Supplement and so on. All right, and, um, and oh my, the, the, the verbosity, the verbosity, you know, the, um, it's, it's, it's clinging to a style that's really quite dead. So I, what I, in, in my essay about writing for the internet, I described how my salon.com column uh, evolved and how I learned that to write for the web, you're writing for, you're writing for a screen. You're writing for the t a TV monitor, okay, essentially. And now, of course, people are reading on, on iPhone. But, you're, but it's, it, the writing for the web, the, the, the web is a visual medium. And you have to, you have to um, write in a different way for it as you would write for, for essays and, and books. So I, I detail my process of discovery of that and how I um, conceive of, of writing for the web as floating blocks, sort of like a Mark Rothko painting, okay, floating in the air. And, um, and, I, and I, I deliberately devised visual um, uh, details and, and, and games you know, for, for it that, so, that the words themselves should look interesting okay, on, on the page. This, this, so this produced my, uh, my salon column, which I, I, I say, um, and nobody has snapped back about this yet, but you know, if they do, I will, I will crush them, all right? Uh, <laughs> My salon column was the first blog, okay? Uh, my salon column invented the blog. Uh, and, no, and no one, okay, was writing like that, okay, writing in a personal way about, uh, about personal events and so on at length on the web, okay, before me. Um, you had Mickey Kaus writing, the only other person doing anything parallel was Mickey Kaus with his political column, but, uh, but I was already writing for the web be before he started. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I feel that um, that's my, part of my, Part of my legacy, I think that some of my uh, my language, my intonations, I, I find it everywhere. <laughs> People don't, I may mean, sort of become almost the voice of the of the web, in in, in ways. All right, so there's that. Um, that I'm, I'm thrilled to finally get out into into print again, and I have been eager to get my my essay on David Bowie. Okay, if I, finally um, it, it it was commissioned for the. Um, for the catalog of, um, of the giant costume show that the Victoria and Albert Museum in London did in 2013. And it's been, um, the, the whole show has been circling the world and um, just huge, people turned out, multiple generations of people turning out to see his uh, costumes and so on. So this is a, an essay I wrote about, about gender, the issue of, uh, it's called you know, David Bowie at the, at the Theater of Gender, David Bowie at the Climax of the sexual revolution. And what I'm, I'm establishing, as if it needed to be established, was that uh, the, current, uh, the current dogma of gender studies, uh, you know, of gender as performative, for heaven's sakes, I mean, David Bowie was way in advance here. And anyone who was alive and breathing, okay, in the early 1970s would have been influenced by, by these ideas. You do not need to hack your way through a lot of post-structuralist garbage, okay, to get to this idea of, of a gender or of human behavior as performative. In fact, it was in, uh, you know, the, the great uh, work, you know, um, uh, presentation of uh, self in everyday life by Irving Goffman, great uh, Canadian-American sociologist, whom uh, Michel Foucault um, stole from, okay, as he stole all of his ideas from prior figures. All right, but I, let's not get sidelined there. You know, I just love to punch Foucault. All right, okay. <laughs> he knew nothing. When will people realize this? All right. Uh, so there's, there's my, the David Bowie essay. I'm, I'm very eager to. Uh, to be seen, you know, in a, a general um, book. And also my piece, oh, I'm so happy finally, my piece on Tom of Finland, okay, that, that was commissioned for the um, Taschen, um, ger a German publisher that, that does fantastic art books. They did the complete collected works of, of, of Tom of Finland, giant volumes, and asked me to, to write on, on him. Uh, on, and he is, for those of you who don't know, he is the creator of the letter Leather look of the, uh, uh, the sadomasochist S and M leather look. Okay, for, of that um, was 
became uh, such a, a dominant uh, uh, icon during um, the period just following the Stonewall Rebellion okay, of 1969. So, so it was 1970s gay men in, um, internationally okay, were, were imitating these, these, these leather-clad personae of, um, of, of Tom of Finland. Like he's incredibly influential. He's not really taken seriously as, as an artist because he's regarded as an illustrator, but you can scarcely imagine uh, in art, you know, any, anyone in the arts having um, a, a greater and more enduring influence than, than Tom of Finland. Okay, and then um, uh, my, my usual themes of, of edu about education. Uh, I'm, after teaching for 47 years, um, I'm in, in absolute despair about what's going on in the public schools. Okay, I think it's an absolute disaster. I, I am well positioned to sense what's going on. Um, I, I'm not one of these you know, professors of the, I'm teaching at a, I teach at a small art school. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not teaching at one of the big Harvard, Princeton, you know, where, where the only, only students who come through are those who um, you know, are the, the most eager beaver, you know, best students, you know, and culled you know, from, from internationally and so on. Uh, I mean, that's not, I, 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 at, at my school, um, the students where I've been teaching for 34 years, this, the students uh, have to audition or have to present their work in order to be admitted to a program. So it, but essentially my school is a vocational school. And because of that, um, also, the, um, they come from a great range of, of social and econ economic backgrounds. Therefore, I, I, I have um, I do have some students, you know, from very good suburban schools. But I also have have students from the, the inner city, African American uh, da dancers and and jazz musicians and so on, including talented dancers from farms in North Carolina, et cetera. So it's, it's a huge range. So I'm able to monitor um, what they know. I, each each class that I have, I'm I, you know, it's not it's not a I don't do those prefab things, okay, where there's like a prefab. This day we're gonna do this, this day we're gonna do that. Okay, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm always reading the, the, the group and see what, what do they know or not know and what, what, do, they, what do they need. And um, I have been horrified, I, I, I think it's probably for 20 straight years now, I've been horrified as year by year by year, the um, amount of cultural, general cultural information that they're able to recognize uh, has, you know, has diminished but also like, absolutely major landmarks in Western culture also have, have receded. And I, I've, it was 15 years ago, I've, I've told this story before, it was 15 years ago already when I was um, uh, in my Art of Song Lyrics course, I was dealing with the, um, with the, the great Negro spiritual Godal Moses, which I had done year after year before that. And I was having trouble on this particular day. I play, you know, play the song, look at the lyric, and I'm trying to explain, I'm trying to talk about it, and I just felt this, this resistance. I felt like I was carrying the entire class, I'd, and I couldn't figure out what, what it was since I had taught that before. And I, it suddenly hit me with, with horror that no one recognized the name Moses. All right? The only people who did were African-American students who have a church background, because of course the church remains a great center of community in African American culture. And I, and I was in despair about this, and I, and I remain in despair, because you know, what, here we have this, this, a good example of the failure of secular humanism. Uh, there's people, you have parents not raising their children with religion because it's, it's the liberated thing to do. Why well, impose all that on them? As a consequence, the, this whole, this access to the Bible, one of the most, most influential works ever written, this compendium of Hebrew poetry with its great hero legends and so on in it. Um, and so there's a whole, dimension of the, the history of culture that um, is lost when uh, young people have no re religious uh, affiliation, whatever. But when, when um, young people no longer recognize the name Moses, okay, you know, what is left of Western civilization? Okay, is, it, what? I mean, they, they know the Kardashians. Okay? <laughs> that's, that's where we are. That's the level we're at. Now, uh, so that, that's another of the, um, the you know, issues for me. Uh, I, w one of my ambitions always from the start okay, was to develop an interpretive technique that could be used for both serious subjects, scholarly subjects, and also for popular culture. 
it's, it's hard to remember a period when being interested in popular culture and thinking it important was considered rather déclassé and, and actually showed that you were not a particularly serious person. Uh, I, I, and when I was in, in graduate school, there's absolutely no doubt, okay, I was in graduate school at Yale from 68 to 72, there's absolutely no doubt that I lost, um, you know, I lost a lot of, of, of points right, with the professors who found it uh, frivolous that I was interested in Hollywood and Hollywood history. Or, or European art films were then, uh, it, you know, didn't have a uh, cultural status coming from out of the 1950s into the 1960s and so on. Um, but uh, um, not, not Hollywood movies, but I, I've, I've always taken uh, popular culture seriously and I, and I long to be able to develop an, an interpretive vocabulary and, a, and an approach that would work for both high culture and what used to be called low culture. I, I'm, um, I call myself a Warholite because Andy Warhol's um, influence fell on me very, very heavily. He, he came from a, an immigrant family in, in, in a factory town in Pittsburgh and so on, and, and he too saw uh, you know, the beauty and, and the you know, magic of, um, of advertising and of the great stars. You, know, you just take a photograph and treat it in some way, a photograph of Elizabeth Taylor or of Marilyn Monroe. These are just movie stills. I mean, he wasn't even, you know, it wasn't that he was actually dr even drawing the original pictures. Um, uh, and um, then Warhol's, uh, I, I was lucky enough in college uh, in upstate New York to, to be able to see uh, Andy Warhol's short films just literally within a year of him um, making them. And these, these short films have disappeared off the cultural map. I, I know they're, they're available at the Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, but um, they're, they're, otherwise people have no acquaintance with them. They, they seem to mix up Paul Morrissey's later movies like Trash and Flesh, okay, with, with, with these, you know, the early films are these improvisational, uh, uh, rather grainy black and white films, uh, rather absurdist that uh, Warhol did with, with drag queens and with, with male hustlers and Edie Sedgwick and uh, et cetera. That and it had a, absolutely an enormous um, impact on me. So I, 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 so I remain um, a Warholite, by which I also mean that, and this is a point I've repeatedly made, that uh, pop art um, ended the avant-garde. Okay? The, the avant-garde uh, was killed by, by pop art. Uh, avant-garde had been a noble tradition going back uh, to, the, to the romanticism, to the early 19th century in terms of, uh, in terms of painting. And the avant-garde artists who are, who are trying to develop an, a new style, um, uh, you know, they paid a price for their um, for their nonconformism, in poverty, okay, in derision, in loss of status, etc. Okay? So there were, there's one avant-garde movement after another of the very highest heroic level, you know, that went on um, for 150 years in the arts. And then um, what happened with you know pop art is when pop when pop art embraced popular culture uh, and and mass media via Warhol and Lichtenstein and so on um, that that space the oppositional space between the fine arts and um, the surrounding media culture ended. Right. So now so since Warhol since pop since pop art um, you know art uh, visual arts have been struggling for some kind of identity. There were different the sort of mini movements. Performance art is probably the most long-lasting. David Bowie can be regarded as actually part of that in the 1970s. Eleanor Anton, whom I've written about in, in Glittering Images, was also a part of that. Um, but on, right now, okay, we're, we're at a period where, um, uh, where avant-garde gestures are mimed, okay, hypocritically mimed. Uh, by people, you, you, you mime them, okay, you do something shocking, take a religious image, okay, Catholicism is the easiest target, okay, and you treat it in a very, you know, very negative way, uh, and oh, wow, you've made an avant-garde gesture. Well, it's absolutely grotesque, okay, derivative and, 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 um, and you know, just uh, contemptible, contemptible, right, because uh, it, it, if, if, you don't, if you don't pay a price for your avant-garde gesture, it's not avant-garde, it's just playing to the gallery, okay, it, it's, it's increasing your, um, you know, it's increasing your income, okay, it's getting your, getting you attention, okay, and acclaim, okay, and then, I'm sorry, uh, it's just, it's absolutely, it's so, there, so as a thread through, through this book are, are the pieces I wrote um, condemning, you know, the Brooklyn Museum's handling 
of the Saatchi show. Um, I, I criticize Jane Alexander's report, okay, about the um, National Endowment for the for the Arts, and I think exposed the you know the, the folly, the the provincialism, the insularity of the um, of the uh, the elites in this country, who who now the entire um, art elite is utterly uh, shot through with political correctness and with. Um, with uh, bromides and cliches, and I, I see very, very little happening in, in the arts that is um, genuinely new any longer. I, I personally believe that creativity in the arts has migrated to animation, okay, uh, to to uh, to game design, okay, uh, and to industrial design. Uh, I think that, that it, but if I can uh, judge by the kinds of uh, you know students in those fields that I've had at the uh, at the University of the Arts, um, there's real conceptual energy you know in the, in those particular fields. But the traditional fine arts have um, have withered and and waned. All right. So now in the, so what else is in uh, is in my book? Um, uh, well, aside from the I have Rihanna, well, who's the only person, the only performer I, I remain interested in is Rihanna. I'm, I'm always interested in, in, in seeing the latest Daily Mail photographs of Rihanna coming out, okay, haughtily okay, from a nightclub at 4 a.m. in London, wearing fabulous colors on her, on her nail polish and so on. I mean, I, I think I think she is truly, art, you know, tr truly an artist in terms of uh, not only the work she's done in music, okay, but also in in fashion design. She's completely uh, independent, and not to mention those those uh, X-rated Instagrams that she was doing for a number of years, but then uh, has unfortunately stopped because um, her mother, okay, and Barbados <laughs> put her foot down, okay, and and read her the Riot Act, and I I believe I may have played a slight role in that, and that's all in the book, okay. Uh. And I feel sad about that, okay? that, that I paid so much attention to, to the Instagrams that suddenly her mother found out. Okay. Um, at any rate, uh, uh, Joan Rivers, okay, I, yeah, who was a great role model for me um, in the book, Gianni Versace. There are a lot of dead people, okay, like, like, you know, like the, the death of Gianni Versace, the death of Norman Mailer. You can just feel the sort of passing of the guard. Uh, Martha Stewart, okay, at, at the height of her, her scandals. Um, oh, and then I have um, pieces, a uh, piece like, um, I have a number of things that, that uh, reflect my teaching, my classroom teaching, and one of them is um, Teaching Shakespeare to Actors, um, which is, was published in a book about Shakespeare, and I, uh, just, uh, you know, just common sense, just, you know, how, how, how does one look at the plays as uh, something to be produced rather than something to be read, you know, on, on the page. And let's see, um, uh, oh, I have um, a number of other things here. Uh, I mean, it's, it, this is an enormously long book, and it was only a fraction of what I've written. I couldn't believe how much I'd written. I, it's, it's a nightmare how much I've been writing <laughs> for like decade after decade. I mean, so there's no way to catch up to it, you know, to all of it. Um, but let, but I, I think a, a strong piece in the book is um, uh, a speech I wrote on, on uh, free speech okay, for a uh, free speech forum at Drexel University a couple of years ago, and I, I take a very extreme position on this, which is that you know, free thought and free speech are absolutely the essence of, uh, of, of, of democracies. Okay. They, are, they are the essence of, of education, and the um, inability of universities um, to enforce of free speech on their campuses, their unwillingness to do so, I think it's a major scandal, absolutely major scandal, and I, I think it exposes the um, gross corruption of the administrative class, which now runs things. I don't know if you realize that that that, that, that um, universities are no longer that. Uh, the, the, the the faculty have no power. Okay, all power has been stripped away from them by these uh, these overpaid uh, and very um, and uh, very self-assured <laughs> bureaucrats. Who are who 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 you know they 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 really are, are the primary engines of a lot of this political correctness on on campus. Um, but I, I find particularly appalling um, the the failure of so many professors uh, nationwide um, in the U.S. to 
be able to, uh, to understand that when, when they're in front of a class, okay, that, that the class is not there as a laboratory you know, for their particular personal political, political ide ideology. I think it's perfectly justified if a professor says what his or her viewpoints are, but they, they must be presented okay, as opinion, okay, and, the, and, the, and the teacher must say, say simul simultaneously, all of you okay, are completely free to take any position you want on any issue, even if it's totally opposite to mine, okay? All right? And uh, the, the failure to do that, um, the, the professors actually think you know, that they have, they have the right to, to dictate, to militate, to tyrannize, you know, to bully. And so I'm, it's, it's shocking to me how these people got into the profession. And it has to do with, with ge the general collapse of any idea, any scholarly standards, whatever, okay, in, 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 in the most, um, in the uh, you know sort of the high neon fields, uh, it really started with women's studies. Okay, we're, 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 uh, not, I'm, I'm saying this as a fem as a feminist. I, I, someone who was writing about gender before second wave feminism. I was writing about it in college. I was writing about it. I was my, my dissertation, sexual persona, was hard to believe. Now was the only dissertation on sex at the Yale Graduate School when, you know, in, when I when I was there. Then after that, within a few short years, everyone was writing writing about sex of course. Um, but women's studies was created, uh, and I, I've been trying to get people to see this for decades, and perhaps now, they're, maybe their eyes are starting to you know, open about it. Um, women's studies was just created with a snap of the fingers, okay, uh, in, by administrators who, um, who wanted to make reparation, visible reparation, for um, the exclusion of, of women, uh, from so many faculties, uh, the, the, the few number of women that, that were on you know, the, the elite school campuses at that time, the, the, the um, undergraduate colleges of, of Yale and Princeton went co-ed okay, at that, that period when I was in, in graduate school. And, um, and, and women's studies, just, it, was just, it, it, it began as uh, essentially window dressing uh, in order to telegraph that this, this college is enlightened, okay, where, and, and just, so they would just throw a lot of money at some women, okay, and let them find their way to create women's studies. Now this makes no sense. This is a, a we're talking here about about the creation, instantaneous creation of a major scholarly field. It, it required some thinking through in terms of what would be the training of, of, of majors in this field. What do they need to know um, in, in terms of uh, uh, anthropology, uh, hi social history, and biology, okay. Now, how is it possible that, um, that gender studies, as it's now called, has been uh, permitted okay, to, to spread, to flourish, without any reference to biology? There's no requirement whatever okay, for um, undergraduates to, uh, to have even a single um, semester of biology. Now, you can end up deciding biology is irrelevant, right? but not to, not, not to expose students to it. Uh, instead, to create an instant canon of, of, of new books okay, by uh, contemporary women's studies professors who in the beginning, many of them came from English departments. They, they didn't even, even come from uh, any, any exposure to social history. And, and the end result is, was, it was, was predictable, because now we have a completely impervious um, uh, you know, some, almost like the Politburo, okay, and, and campus after campus, okay, and, and the excesses of, of gender studies, okay, have, have like spilled over into, uh, into real life and are affecting, and, and so now, now we get, you know, in Hungary, there's, <laughs> you get, you're getting, you know, efforts on the far right to ban gender studies completely from the universities because it's, it's an ideology, you know, and not, um, and not a, a scholarly discipline. And I thought, what, and this is a principle um, that I have observed, it's in, my, it's in the book, okay, in terms of my writing for Salon and so on, which is that when, 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 when problems on the left are not dealt with, okay, are, not, are not honestly and courageously dealt with, those problems go underground and gain in force and will eventually erupt on the right. This is a principle I, I, I find in you know, there's examples in the book, such as you know, what happened when, um, you know, when Janet Reno sent uh, you know, tanks to go knock down the walls of citizens at the, at the Koresh Ranch, uh, and you had uh, a, f a fire in which, uh, in which both you know, adults and children died. 
Um, and the, the media said nothing about this, okay, whatever. Um, the, 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 this inc incredible a violation okay, of, of normal, um, the, you know, the normal humane um, procedure on the part of a democratic government. They said nothing. Okay? Everything was suppressed because it was the, the new Clinton administration. So what happened? The issue went underground, got fiercer, and, and it erupted two years later in the attack on the mural building okay, by that, by that, that fanatic, right-wing fanatic, okay, who killed incredible numbers of people. Right? So, this is, so this is what's happening now, is that uh, gender studies is an ideology. Okay? It is not a scholarly discipline as, as presently constructed in the universities. Right? And why, does, why wasn't this dealt with on the left? Why was there no critique on the left? Nothing. And so it goes underground, and now it erupts in Hungary uh, on, you know, on the far right. Okay? And so that's just, it just um, and I think a lot, uh, there are a lot of, items in the book, um, in, in, especially in the Media Chronicle in the back of, of the book, that show how I believe prescient I was as a Democrat in uh, critiquing in my Salon column uh, problems in the Democratic Party, uh, and pro problems in the the uh, the trending of the party toward uh, toward lawyers, okay, and toward uh, Goldman Sachs and, and things like that, um, and that, that these problems could be seen very very distantly, right? But no, people didn't want to deal with it, right? and so as a consequence, you get again dissatisfactions among the populace going underground, and um, I, so I I was not. Uh, so, uh, I was not surprised, as a Democrat, I was not surprised um, by the election of, uh, of Donald Trump. The only people who could be surprised are those who, who like, had this rosy-eyed view of, of, um, of uh, Democratic ideals which were not, in my view, you know, being met. I'm, I'm, I'm a Bernie Sanders voter. Right? Uh, so I think that um, I'm hoping to serve as a role model to young uh, people writing about politics to say that you, if, if you really want to write or uh, study politics and analyze it and you know and um, become known as an as an as an analyst, you have you have to in some way rise above your own uh, partisan um, instincts. Otherwise, you just fall into the same you know dualistic. Um, uh, dead ends okay, that, that we're in. That so many people. I mean, you can. You. You. you that's why. T t a discussion of um, of uh, politics on TV has become uh, utterly enervating. There's really you, you, people are on one side or the other. Everything is pitched okay, on the shows uh, as you know, in terms of op opposites. Are, are you going to wave me? Oh, I have five minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, uh. All right. Thank you. All right, we, we, this is a pre-plan. Okay. I, I have to be terminated. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, what was I saying about TV? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's hard to believe that in the 1990s there were like there were really good shows on on TV. Uh, even Crossfire, which it would seem like those are opposites, you know, two two people taking opposite views. Actually, a range of, of viewpoint was actually actually permitted on TV once. You didn't have to fall into a box uh, like uh, and have people screaming at each other. With, I mean, you you know these shows now. You know what people are going to say before they open their mouths. Right? But, but it, honestly, it was not the case. Um, in case, you know, there were so many examples. Uh, one of my favorites was um, uh, on CNN, CNN and Company at 11.30 a.m. And I believe it was Kathleen Tillotson, I believe. She, she was a Southern lady. This was when, when CNN was more based in Atlanta. And she would have uh, every day three women, three professional women on by satellite, three, uh, all different women, just to discuss the day's issues. Okay? And without any, no, associ no assistant producer getting on the phone ahead of time and drilling, you know, and finding out what are you going to say on air, okay? Just letting us talk on air. And, and, and it was, I thought that was marvelous. I think that, you know, most people's uh, political viewpoints are, are, are flexible. They're not, they're not in this crazy polarized, uh, in rather child, childish opposition that is encouraged in American television. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not kidding about those assistant producers. They are a plague, okay? I, 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 I refuse, I mean, I don't go on TV anymore. It's useless, right? Um, but but um, they are, I, I would refuse to do th th those. I mean, assistant producer wants to find out what you're gonna say, excuse me, they're taking all the energy out, you know, and, and, and the spontaneity out of your actual <laughs> performance on the, on the show itself. I wish people would fight back against that. Um, it, but it, 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 speak of childish, okay, it's, it's sort of, it's a grade school. It just shows the level, okay, of, of, uh, of American television. Of course, the media in general have, uh, I speak as a professor of media studies, um, and journalism is dead. I mean, it's a big stinking corpse, okay, in the United States right now. I mean, forget, you know, forget that. 
All right. Oh, what, what else? What are my last things here? I, I, I have to pick and choose here. <laughs> um, oh, I've hit so many things, though. Wow. Okay. All right. <laughs> oh, I'll make my big statement about feminism. Okay. All right. Let me remind, okay, people who have read me before, okay, or, I, I, I am an equity feminist. That is, um, I believe, in equality of opportunity okay, for women uh, in the professional and political realms, so you're removing barriers for their advancement. However, I oppose all special protections for women. I feel that special protections of any kind are ultimately patronizing, paternalistic, okay, and infantilizing. I, 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 I want to treat the workplace as a, a gender neutral zone right, and, and which, uh, yes, okay, uh, if you know, cases of sexual abuse should be pursued, um, but I believe that it's up to individual women also to communicate through their manner and through their speech and their actions, okay, what they will tolerate and what they will not tolerate. Um, I, I, I find that, there's, in my view, there is no excuse okay, for a highly educated uh, upper middle class woman, okay, professional, uh, to, to be saying that she does not have the power okay, to um, say something back or to sc scold or to complain or, or whatever. I think, that's, I think it's absolute nonsense that, that what that is is, is a, a woman putting her career advantage okay, over her innate uh, dignity and self-respect. Uh, and that and it is the working class women who are really uh, unable to fight back, w women who really depend on an income for their children and so on, perhaps their single parents, et cetera. Uh, but all this complaining, okay, by, by middle class women, right, about, uh, and this invoking of, uh, of an oversight panels, this is what, what I absolutely loathe as a, you know, as a veteran of the 1960s, for heaven's sakes, um, is this um, deputizing of paternalistic uh, figures uh, who, who are now are going have this power of surveillance over personal life and person, personal uh, behavior. I think it's a terrible mistake, okay, this, um, when that, whenever you have a growth of any kind of, um, of, a, of a bureaucracy. Bureaucracies blow and blow and blow, okay, and eventually become tyrannical. It's actually the history of the, of the decline and fall of every, every culture, okay. It, it should be built into every bureaucracy some sort of, of a mechanism that, that constantly curtails its size and its power. Um, the, but, you know, the situation on college campuses is outrageous. I, mean, I, I, I have taken the extreme view all, all along, and I'm a college teacher, okay, which is that uh, college administrations have no business okay, uh, intervening in or surveilling students' social lives. I take the extreme view on it. None. Zero. Okay? If a crime is committed on a campus, give it to the police. Right? Uh, so this business of, 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 uh, of now you know, paternal, of, uh, paternalistic figures on campus um, taking, you know, taking, listening and hand-holding and hearing about what happened on a date, what kind, this is, this is such a betrayal of the, um, of the, the you know, the, of the uh, sexual revolution of the 1960s, which my generation of women, okay, had uh, so supported. Okay, we want, we want independent lives, independent thoughts, okay, ind independent uh, relationships with other people, and not these nanny figures, okay, these uh, substitute parent figures uh, constantly um, hovering. Okay, are we ready to, okay, all right. All right. Okay. Oh. Oh. How are you defining second wave feminism, and who would be on the forefront of that "quote unquote" movement? A second wave feminism. Well, um, obviously, Betty Friedan is the one who kicked it into motion when she founded uh, the National Organization for Women. Co-founded it in 1966. It was the first uh, organization, political organization, devoted to women's rights since in, in America since uh, women had won the right to vote in 1920. So she has a, had a pivotal role in, in setting it forth. But then she herself quarreled okay, with other members of, of now, and she was eventually booted out of it. Okay, uh, and, and part of it, one one of her many her lists of you know she's very abrasive of personality, um, forceful personality. I, I admired her, uh, but she was she could be unreasonable. Um, and and uh, it was when she called you know the young lesbians you know the, the lavender menace. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, that there was this big re revolt, you know, against against her, um, and 
uh, her, you know, her, the, the book, when we look back at, at um, you know, at The Feminine Mystique, which was a surprise bestseller in 1963, okay, uh, when you look back at it, there are a lot of problems with it, such as th there are no sources, okay? The whole thing is unsourced, okay? Right? And, the, and, and the list, you know, the, the list of grievances and disasters that, that, that she says flowed, okay, from women's, you know, lack of uh, professional opportunities in life and so on, I mean, it's, it's everything. She, she like she lists uh, cancers, you know, the body cankers. I mean, it's like I mean, like every every possible human disaster, every plague. Okay, like plagues of locusts. Okay, you know, came from. I mean, and, and you really and you can you feel the hysteria in, in the book. Uh, there's also things in it that are um, that uh, are very surprising, such as she rejects. Um, she rejects abstract expressionism. <laughs> I mean, it's like foreign films. I mean, this is all, this whole, I mean it's, a, it's a rather provincial, uh, culturally speaking. But at any rate, other people took over. Okay, and by by the early 1970s, you ha you, you have Gloria Steinem okay, emerging as the face of, of feminism, and and um, Bet Betty Friedan uh, resented it. But, uh, she said, "Oh, Gloria goes to Kenneth to have her hair streaked." Okay, which which was true, right? And Gloria Steinem was very um, photo. Telegenic, okay, at a time when television um, was you know, very important, and I, I admired her. Um, it's it's, good, it's going to be hard to believe, okay, but Time Magazine, which I yes, subscribe to, uh, actually asked the question, okay, in the early 70s, uh, who would make a good, you know, first woman president? And I wrote in Gloria Steinem. Do you believe it? Okay, and I, because I, I said, oh, when age has dimmed her beauty and so and so on. All right, now I thought better of it, okay, you know, later on. But she, um, but so Steinem, okay, Steinem has a man problem, okay, so this, 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 an, this, this, this anti-male thing got embedded into feminism from a lot of these, there, there's some women who are really borderline crazy women at the very beginning, okay, some of them are really <laughs> radical ones, right, but Steinem, um, you know, she was, she's not an original creator of, uh, of ideas, uh, but, but she was a wonderful presence. I mean, she, she's, she's the one who really established that it was possible to be a reasonable person, okay, and, uh, you know, an attractive woman, okay, and be a feminist. That you didn't, you, 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 people were not always like, Andrew Dworkin, you know, and so on, uh, like that. <laughs> Right. Uh, so, all right, so what happened was, I tried to join, I mean, I, I was, you know, I was, you know, I'm like this completely, um, heterodox personality, okay, uh, you know, aggressive, always in trouble, et cetera, et cetera. I tried to join the women's movement. I got booted out again and again and again, okay. I've, to I've written about it, okay, like, you know, that, like, when, when it was 1970, 71, when I had that, almost that, that fist fight, okay, with the New Haven Women's Liberation Rock Band, okay, all right, because, uh, because I was defending the Rolling Stones, okay, uh, and, 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 and uh, I had this huge screaming argument about the song, Rolling Stones song, Under My Thumb, and I said, look, I said, Under My Thumb, the lyrics are sexist, yes, okay, all right, but it's a great, this is a great song, and it's, in, fa in fact, it's a work of art, okay, and I still maintain that, that under my thumb is a work of art. Okay, you had the, the incredible marimba. Okay, of Brian Jones in there. It's it's phen phenomenal. And also, if you listen to the lyrics in an intelligent manner, you can see that that there, that there is a. It's about a power reversal. Okay, that's almost like something out of William Blake, where once she had me down, now I've got her down. Well, you know, in William Blake, she'll get him down again in the next, you know, the cycle, etc. It's like the whole power dynamic of, of sex. Um, uh, but oh my God! Oh, they, they was like a hard, and they were probably spitting in my face. They, and they, they said, they said, I, I, I said, this is a work of art. Art, art. Nothing that demeans women can be art. Did you hear that? I'm going to repeat it. Okay. All right. These feminist rock musicians said, nothing that demeans women can be art. Right there, you have it. The Stalinist view of art, okay? I follow Oscar Wilde, my first influence, okay, it was like a, a book called The Epigrams of Oscar Wilde that I, I stumbled on in a secondhand bookstore in Syracuse when I was 14, all right? And I, there's maxims about art and about the independence of art and, and art's freedom from philanthropy and, and, and humanitarians and all these do-gooders and so on, right? And I didn't quite understand everything in that book, but now I understand it, okay? Everyone who wants to clean up art, make art, politically correct, okay, make it manageable, okay, make it palatable, okay, and so I, I, I complain, I mean, we, we need another Oscar Wilde right now, um, but wait, we, uh, now back to your question, wait, you, uh, wait what, was, what was your question, it was about, about, some, some, all right, 
I think it was about the second wave of feminism. Yeah. Who would you call one of the leaders of the second wave of feminism? Yeah, okay, so it's like Gloria Steinem is the face you know, of feminism, all right? They, Kate Millett was put on the cover of Time magazine for her book, okay, Sexual Politics, all right? and, she didn't, and uh, um, she didn't particularly like the attention or want the attention um, from it. Uh, and and um, so Sexual Politics, is, is the book, 1970, that, or is it 71, that, create, that, that created the template, okay, of which is, which is this, you know, taking ideology, wading in, you know, into some famous book by a, a male artist, okay, and with your rubber stamp going misogyny, sexism, like that, you know, so on. Kate Millett created that style, okay, all right. And, um, and even to this day, people go on about, about her. She was this, she was that. Well, you know, I, after uh, the Betty Friedan, the anniversary of that book, okay, um, and I, 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 you know, I, cont I contributed to like roundtable things talking about the, the impact of that book, I thought, I want to take another look at sexual politics again. And I looked at that book, and I think there's a lot of problems with that book, okay? There are all kinds of problems because it's, uh, uh, to me, it's uh, very odd that Kate Millett, okay, that for the rest of her life, she never wrote a, a, a paragraph that was even remotely like that book. All right. She went out. She be, she wrote memoirs. She wrote. She wrote all kinds of you know other other things. She became a sculptor. You know, up in uh, up the Hudson or whatever she was doing, uh, and so on. Um, and I, 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 I you know I, I really think that someone needs to dig into the history of, of that book. Okay, because I, I I hear a voice in that book that is. Not her voice. Okay. I hear another. I think it's a man's voice. Okay, all right, and it's a man. It's one of her professors. It's either a professor that, that she had at Oxford or it's a professor at Columbia. All right, and I and I and, and I think it's if, if this, I mean she in in her um, you know in the acknowledgments she does have a list of names and there is a there is a you know a mention of a, a couple of male professors and so on. But I think that you know if if this book this book which became so important and Monumental and still remembered as a landmark of, of new feminism and so on. If I, I want it to be admitted, the degree to which a man, okay, used his knowledge, okay, his syntax, okay, right, and contributed to that book, okay. She did not honestly acknowledge how much. I mean, I don't think it was all, all that, okay. But I, I hear a voice that it was distinctly older than our generation, because she was like my generation, I think, roughly. Although I think she's a little older than me, but, um, uh, but there was a certain sound of uh, that that Columbia professor professors had that, that I began to pick up because I have, I have met and had such great relationships with actually um, graduates of Columbia, the great books program of Columbia. For some reason, we're on the same, well, well for some reasons, obvious, okay? They have read all the great books, right? And they, so therefore, their minds are structured, okay, and organized in ways that um, post-structuralism can't even hope to do. All right, but anyway, uh, um, I, I, so the, um, then the late, later on there was Andrew Dworkin, okay, in the, in the 1980s, she became a leading figure of, of second wave feminism. And then there was the third wave of, in the 1990s that sort of sputtered up and sputtered out. Um, uh, and there was like Naomi Wolf and uh, you know, Susan Faludi, uh, who was, uh, and who Gloria Steinem embraced, okay, in, in a famous Time Magazine cover, you could find it on the web, okay, where they look like um, terrorists or, or, or like you know, underground ground people clinging to each other in a bare room. People said, well, what kind of vision of feminism is that, these two women? But, but that's where Gloria Steinem gave her, you know, imprimatur to Susan Faludi, who, you'll notice, Susan Faludi's career immediately sank after that. <laughs> I mean, she came. She came out. She came uh, with a memoir about, uh, about two years ago, about her father and you know having, having now turned transgender and wherever he is in Europe, and um, and now and now she's recounting um, the horrors of her childhood, her, her father you know attacking her mother's lover okay with a knife all over the house, blood all over the house. I thought this is her childhood, right? And this, I mean, I want I want feminists you know to come from good families, okay, and solid families. I don't. <laughs> 
Why, why is every single feminist, you know, like Trace, you know, Gloria Steinem, <laughs> I mean, she's written a lot about, about it. Like her, her mother was, it was mentally disturbed and, and, and Gloria Steinem had to, had to nurse her. The father abandoned them to a rat-filled apartment and so on. This is like, this is why they're so anti-male, okay? They, they're just anti their fathers. It's not really, this, I, I have been trying to get the anti-male you know, uh, you know, obsession of feminism out of it, okay, from decade after decade after decade. And I, I, you know, I constantly say, only weak women cannot admit the strength of men and of the great achievements of men, okay? I, I've learned incredible amount from men, okay, all right? I admire men, okay, all right? I'm, I, I, don't, I don't feel I have to like, you know, say, oh, they're all toxic and they're all, you know, and like always, you know, the little, the little claws out and so on and so forth, all right? And it's, it's gotten really bad. You know, you, you all know how bad it's gotten, okay? Where everything about, ma anything masculine is automatically defined, okay, as a social construction, all right? Oh, oh, please, okay, my, my, my father's generation, went to World War II, okay, my, my father was a paratrooper, I, I've got all of my uncles, they were in the Navy, and, you know, in the, in the Army and so on, okay, I saw men, okay, men who could do anything, okay, you know, men, men who could like, take a piece of wood and, and like make, you know, thing like, kind of, <laughs> capable men, you know, men, uh, men who respected women, there was no abuse, okay, that I was ever, uh, not, you know, my whole Italian uh, American experience upstate New York, never an example of anyone dishonoring a woman or abusing a woman, okay? These were, men, these were incredibly, you know, talented men uh, who could do uh, anything, okay? I, I have like nutball, you know, my, 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 you know, my uncle would make on his off hours, absolutely work of art, okay, and so on. You know, my grandfather would be making baskets in the, in the backyard. They, they worked, 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 to, they gave, gave, gave to women and children. Men have been sacrificing for women and children for like millennia, and so instead we have all this like focus on the, on the horrors of men, the, the worst men the brutal men, okay? Well, every, every brutal person should be, you know, should be jailed, okay? I, I mean, obviously. Oh, sorry, am I going on too long? I think we're actually out of time. Oh, I'm oh. Sorry. I'm right. sorry we couldn't get to your other questions. <laughs> I'm very sorry. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs>